Good evening from the Gail Lemron Auditorium on the campus of Embry-Riddle in Daytona Beach. Welcome to the President's Speaker Series. On behalf of President John P. Johnson, I'm Mark Bernier, the moderator for tonight's event. Tonight, a different opportunity at a guest for you to all hear and enjoy. The story of a man, language, his father, the Vietnam experience, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be a little different from the political and social issues we talk about, but it reminds us of the difference between men and women. This is not Mars and Venus, but the story of a young man who grows up and learns the truth not only about himself, but about his family. And he learns a lot about himself through talking to others. The story is the language of men. And our guest tonight joining us from Massachusetts is Anthony Diarius. Anthony, thanks for coming in to talk with us about your memoir tonight. Thanks for having me. The, the whole issue of the book opening with the Vietnam experience, the thing that got me was, what prompted you to say to Vanessa, your wife, let's go to Vietnam and find out what dad experienced? <laughs> um, well, I guess it, it kind of began with a lot of the interviews that I had done with my father. and. The, the main focus of those interviews was his time in Vietnam. I was really fascinated by his time in Vietnam. Um, I kind of maybe naively in my head built it up to be this defining moment in his life and I wanted to know more about it. Um, so that's kind of where my conversations with my father began. And then um, <laughs> I was expecting you know, some, I, I grew up with a kind of Hollywood version of what the Vietnam War was, as a lot of people in my generation did. Um, so I was expecting those types of stories. And uh, the stories that I got were more about uh, my father's relationships with prostitutes during the war and his very candid descriptions of it. My dad has just an amazing, colorful vocabulary that I describe in the book as a mixture of, um, you know, Foghorn Leghorn and Richard Pryor. And it, he just has such a, you know, this, this mishmash of movie quotes and song lyrics and um, this slang that I was always just so fascinated with. Um, so his stories led me to a place where I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting um, that to be the focus of our conversations. Um, but then later on, um, my wife, Vanessa, who's a feminist, uh, started doing work um, with uh, women's health, women's reproductive rights, and she actually got a job teaching um, health and anatomy classes to former sex workers in Vietnam. And it was right at a point in the process of writing the book that I felt like I wanted to go to Vietnam, spend some time there. Um, and it, f it was one of those, the monologue that begins the book uh, in my, my father's monologue, um, just was one of the most kind of colorful and interesting stories that he told me. Um, and it kind of touched on a lot of economic issues that I was interested in and his experiences while he was there. And it just, it felt like a nice kind of explosive way to start the book. This whole idea for this event came as a result of a suggestion from Dr. M.B. McClatchy. And when she brought the idea to me, I had no idea that I would learn what I've learned. And I complete, I read these books right before the guest arrives so that the ideas are still fresh in my mind as well as they would be with any reviewer. Mm. And I had no idea about all of the different experiences that people are going to find if they read this book. Would you say that your relationship, from what I read, was you were closer to your father and mother than your brother? Yeah, I think in some ways. Um, I think I was especially close. I think I was close with my mother and my father, but in separate ways. Um, my dad and I did a lot of kind of physical things. We rebuilt cars. We um, just spent a lot of time doing, you know, Cub Scouts, camping, things like that. Um, with my mother, it was more talking. Um, and I think I tried to kind of combine that. A lot of the talking that I do with my mom, I was like, I could ask her questions. I could question her about things. Um, I wanted to do the same with my father. And I think that's partly where the book began too, was kind of questioning some of the things that we just did naturally or instinctively. Was this therapy for you? Um, 
I, I, I don't like to use the word therapy with memoir. I think memoir often gets misconstrued as some kind of therapeutic act. Um, I think it can be. Um, I think in a lot of ways, um, it changed relationships in my life with you know my my father and some other people in my family, other family members. But um, I, I don't see it as kind of a, a, a therapeutic act. Or yeah, I, I want to separate the difference between kind of just getting something off your chest and um, searching through your memories and your past for. Uh, connections or trying to um, shape your memories into some kind of form or narrative, um, which was what kind of drew me to memoir, was kind of that here's, you know, so compared to a fiction writer, where a fiction writer might be you know, creating um, scenes from scratch, uh, I like the idea of having the ingredients there, and then I have to decide what I'm making, what I'm cooking up. Now, before we get to the Vietnam experience, just to share with you, anyone who buys this book, there are things that everyone in this room has had happen. You wonder, why do these things happen in families? Classic example, it's Christmas Day, and it's a holy day, and it's a day of reverence and the birth of Jesus and giving. What is this family doing? They're watching De Niro movies. And on the couch, it's your father, and he's seen these movies many times. Mm -hmm. What, to me, you know, and your mom said what people have always said. Why did they show these things on Christmas? Talk and, about that a little bit. And yeah, when my mom says that, my dad responds, it's a tape. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was just something so natural that we didn't really even question. It was like, why not watch gangster movies when we're sh and they're shooting each other up while mom's making pancakes in the kitchen on Christmas? <laughs> um, and it became this very kind of iconic scene for me because here's a moment where all the guys are in the living room and we're you know almost in a huddle right we're huddled around the uh, TV watching this movie that we know by heart we can recite these lines um, we're communicating but we're communicating with other people's words and we, you know we're comfortable in that zone um, and there were a lot of moments where I felt like my mom was outside that huddle and trying to kind of break in in certain moments. Um, and the language that we had together that kind of referenced these movies and songs and these things that we thought were just for us. My mom often knew those lyrics, yeah. knew those quotes, um, but she was kind of boxed out sometimes. I found it interesting <laughs> because the mother's raising all these questions, yet she bought dad a big TV. Well, yeah, well, yeah there was, you know, there's a little back and forth there. <laughs> How would you describe the relationship between your parents? I think it's great. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it's really strong. Um, I think what, what kind of led me to start questioning a lot of things was, so I grew up in a male-dominated house where it was more kind of unspoken and physical, where my wife grew up in a house of mostly women and I would go over there and the TV would be off and they'd be sitting on the couch asking each other questions um, and talking. And they knew so much about each other and they talked so often. And it just fascinated me uh, from the start. So I figured, okay, let me, let me try to do that with my family. Let me go, <laughs> let me start asking these questions or trying to communicate in the way that I see my wife communicating with her family. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, not, as immediate as I may have, again, naively expected in the beginning, like I'm gonna publish this book and my family's gonna read it and everything's gonna change, You did right? it for family exercise at well, first? No, I mean, I was, I think some part of me, I was, I was doing it anyway, I wanted to write this book, but some part of me was like, well, what will change or will anything change? Will the way that we communicate change? Um, and I think it's kind of naive to expect the book to do that. You know, it was such a, it was such a big part of my life. I spent so much time on it. For, for me, writing was that book. And when writing, when I was done with the book, there was kind of this, you know, something like postpartum depression, yeah. you know? There was kind of like, well, if I'm not writing that book, what am I writing? But back to your question, I think, um, I, I think some parts in the book 
my, I just remember my mother saying that she was surprised that I noticed these things, or I, I didn't think anyone, anyone was listening, was kind of a comment that she would say sometimes. Um, so I think it has, it's definitely kind of <laughs> sent a ripple effect through my family. And it's been different, it's been a roller coaster in a lot of ways. Um, sometimes it's brought us closer, sometimes it hasn't. Um, did anybody step up, either Don, your brother, or dad, or mom, and say, you can't put don't that do in? No, that's the thing. I mean, they were always so supportive. And I was very transparent. I was, you know, this is what I'm working on. Here's the draft. Here's what I'm doing. I didn't see the need to add any kind of surprise to it. Um, so, and they'd come to readings. They, they knew I was working on um, stories about our family. and. Um, so I didn't, I didn't want to blindside anyone. This book is very personal and somewhat shocking at times. Mm. You reveal things about yourself that are pretty deep mm. and sometimes dark that I would not have expected a person to put in a memoir, mm. an addiction to pornography, mm. and how it happens, and how it changed things between you and Vanessa for a while. How did you get that under control? Um, I think it was one of those things where, I mean, the entire book is really about this idea of not questioning your behavior, right? So, you know, I think a lot of the book is about me trying to decide what it means to be a man. So is being a man being violent? Is being a man being destructive? Is being a man being, you know, um, closed off or emotionally illiterate? And I also felt like inherent in some of that kind of stereotypical macho behavior that I was taking in wholesale and not questioning was kind of, you know, demeaning women, putting down women, or seeing women as objects. And um, I feel like I just kind of, you know, we, my friends and I traded pornography like baseball cards. And I think a lot of kids, a lot of boys growing up do. And um, I think, Having my wife's perspective, you know, a strong feminist perspective on that, um, kind of just showed my behavior in a new light, and I was not um, behavior that I was not questioning before. Um, Did you get help to stop? No, I mean, you it was stopped on your own. Yeah, I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't want. She wanna... was working. She in the book. She's working your home. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another big part of it too, right? This kind of work and when you're unemployed, you know, how does that affect kind of your understanding of masculinity and that, you know, kind of um, if you're expected to provide or some way like that. Um, I no, I mean, I don't. I don't want it to seem like it was, you know, something that was completely out of control. It was just, you know when behavior that I wasn't questioning started to impact my life, started to impact my relationship with Vanessa. Um, I was trying to kind of take all of these kind of immature um, things that I just kind of took for granted when I was surrounded by guys and this is what we do or this is, you know, just, you know, trying to take that behavior and maintain it in a open, relationship, communicating, you know, a strong uh, basis of communication in the relationship, I, they were just clashing. Worlds were kind of clashing in that moment. You know, I was, I was 22, Vanessa and I were just living together, and it was me not knowing, you know, what the hell I was doing with my life and, you know, trying to kind of figure out just who I wanted to be and how I was going to do that and how am I going to maintain some of the things that I felt comfortable with if they're not going to fit into where um, I want to go or what I want to do. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, kind of at the root of any addiction is just impulsive behavior that you don't question that starts to affect your entire life, starts to affect your relationships. The, the, the story I found remarkable, Vanessa is home, pregnant, awaiting the arrival of your first child in April? Yes. How were you able to put it back together? Because she came home, she discovered you. I thought, this is it. And I turned the page, and 
you put it back together, <laughs> you eventually marry, and you have your life now. Yeah. You know, a remarkable couple. Did you rely on faith? Or was there some intervention that helped make the change? No, I mean, we just, we just kind of had it out a lot, you know? It was just, um, I think that was something that, um, you know, I saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of friends, parents who were very vocal, very, um, very, you know, open to argue and wouldn't hesitate to argue and learn how to argue well. And um, I think there were moments where my parents probably should have argued, right? Um, should have, you know, had it out. And I, I think between me and Vanessa, we, we just kind of, we kind of, it sounds cliche, but we kind of brought out the best in each other in terms of not backing down from things that we felt were taboo or off limits. Um, and we're at a point in our relationship now where there is nothing is off limits, nothing is. And I think that's a big part of the pornography piece too, is that, okay, this is something guys do in secret. You know, uh, we watch pornography and we masturbate by ourselves, and this is something we can't talk about. It has to be a separate thing from our relationship with our wives or partners. And um, in that secrecy, in that lack of communication, is where the problem grew into something more severe, where it was the mystery around not talking about it. And um, I think that's when it became problematic. Listeners, viewers, and readers will learn that you are part of a gang. I think the Destructos of some kind. <laughs> in high school, oh God. <laughs> to hear someone else say it, it sounds so lame. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm reading. It was, it was. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is a group that I think uh, we're talking in New York, Long Island, yeah. perhaps? Okay, uh -huh. where in Long Island? Uh, a town called Northport. Okay, and you go down some stairs, and I don't know whether everybody had been drinking or what, you punch out a glass. Oh, that was in, that was in, 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 um, in New York City. Uh, this is before marriage? Yeah, this, we were going down to a subway. So yeah. how many are in this group? Four or five. Four or five, okay, called the Destructos. Yeah. You've been punching each other, real rough housing. Yeah. And I guess somebody, this is post 9-11, so there's an officer with a gun in that area who sees you and says, all right, up against the wall? Yeah. What happened? Were you arrested for destroying public property? No, see, that was the thing. I mean, we always kind of were able to sneak away and <laughs> not get caught. And I think that, yeah, it was, it was right after, pretty soon after 9-11, so there was a big, you know, strong military presence in New York City at the time, and there was, you know, guns and dogs, and it was very visible. Um, and I remember the the guy saying, you know, you're going to pull this shit while all this other stuff is going on. I mean, that's what it, the, yeah. you know, that was his first reaction. And it was something that we didn't think about at the time, obviously. It was just, you know, we were kind of caught up in that, you know, that jackass type of behavior where it's, you know, um, my friends were kind of, you know, into BMX bikes and skateboarding and just hurting ourselves. <laughs> and I think there was this kind of, you know, um, competitive nature of, you know, who can hurt themselves the most and this kind of show of, I don't know, resiliency or endurance in some way when it was really just about self-destruction and drinking. Why did you decide to call it the language of men? Because uh, <laughs> I kept feeling like each time, each, you know, event or each um, scene that I was writing about um, was kind of rooted in communication and rooted back into how we decide what we can talk about and what we can't, and what's communicated through verbal language, what's communicated through just the way we interact with each other, um, how we communicate our identity through language, and how we communicate our kind of changing identity through language. When you went over to Vietnam, how long were you there? Uh, my wife and I were there for about three and a half months. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. And she starts, in the book, she gets a little edgy after a while, because this is post-marriage, post the pornography period, all of that. Mm. And you're finding all of these houses of prostitution in places that your father frequented. Was it shocking? Was it hurtful? Did it bother you when you found out, yeah, my dad did this? But... No, I mean, it was... No, because I mean, like I grew up with that Hollywood version of it. And I had, you know, I, at that point when I was in Vietnam, I, had, I was started to read 
books written from um, women's perspective, from Vietnamese women's perspective, from American women's perspectives, um, a lot of oral histories by um, uh, sex workers during the war, um, just because that was a, a side of the war that wasn't often portrayed in the movies that we were watching. It was really just portrayed as, you know, we all know the Full Metal Jacket scene, right? We just, you know, it's, but we didn't hear those women talk. We didn't hear their stories. So the collections of oral histories that I read were really, really incredible for me to read. And, and, then, and then here I am in Vietnam while my wife is working with former sex workers, some of whom were sex workers during the war. Um, and I think at that point, I was still just wandering around trying to figure out what I was writing about. You know, I knew I was interested in these stories. I knew that, you know, the, um, this opportunity to go to Vietnam presented itself, and there was a lot of overlap. And, um, you know, I, there's times as a memoirist or, a, you know, a nonfiction writer where uh, life kind of tells you what you should be writing about. And it was one of those moments where a lot of things are kind of overlapping here. There's something there. There's, even though I don't know what I'm writing about, there's still something that keeps drawing me back to this, you know, pile of Word documents on my computer. And I, I think for my, for Vanessa, um, she was unclear on what my fascination was with all of yeah. this. You know, here I am, I'm, I'm going to Vietnam with Vanessa, I have a tape recorder of my dad's interviews, and I'm kind of replaying them at certain points, almost as if he's narrating our trip. And, you know, after a while, she's just like, all right, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand why you're so obsessed with these stories. Like, I'm going every day to a place where I'm trying to teach these women to, um, you know, teaching basic anatomy and uh, reproductive rights courses, and you know, you're still caught up in this kind of Hollywood version of things. And there was, you know, a, a moment where, you know, we go to a movie theater in Vietnam and we're, uh, they're playing Casualties of War, um, the Michael J. Fox movie. And the... There's a very violent scene in there, and I think you write about that. Yeah, I mean, the movie is a basically, you know, a 90-minute rape scene where the uh, Vietnamese woman is captured and they just kind of take her through on tour with them and Michael J. Fox is struggling to speak up or not speak up. And we're in this movie theater in Hanoi watching this, and it's full of Americans. The, the movie theater was full of Americans. We didn't see really any Vietnamese people watching this movie. And I kind of started to question, like, why, why am I doing this? I'm coming all the way to Vietnam, and I'm watching an American uh, Hollywood version of the war. Um, so I think that was something that was interesting to me, too, was what's real, what's not, what's an image, what's a reproduction. We're going to come through the audience to take your questions for our guest, for Anthony Diarius. But before you went to Vietnam, did your dad try to talk you out of going? Uh, no. I mean, he was surprised that I was going, but he wasn't, you know, he wouldn't try to talk me out of going. Um, I think he was really amazed by my interest in it and that I would want to do that. Um, and that we would do that. It wouldn't, you know, it wasn't something like, oh, we should go, we should do that. It was, we're going to do this. What was your grandfather like? Do we know much about your grandfather? My, my father's father? Yeah. Um, I have really good memories of him, but I, I've heard stories of him having a very a quick temper or being, um, having this very strong presence. He, was, he spent a lot of time out of work, too, and I know that wasn't a good time for him. And I think this idea of work also fascinated, fascinated me, too. About this is the guy that tried to get into the aluminum siding business and a few yeah. other things. Yeah. And it didn't quite make it. And he was yeah. Out of that was kind of something that my dad and I have talked about, um, where he, his father seemed to always be kind of you know, one step behind these kind of big things that would have maybe turned into a career or um, given him some fulfillment in some way. And when he was out of work is, from the stories I've gathered, is the time when he felt very... Um, just kind of unmoored and depressed. And um, then this opportunity came up for my grandmother and him to uh, be caretakers on a farm on Long Island. And having that work, having that purpose uh, kind of grounded him in a lot of ways that he didn't always have in his life. And I, I experienced the same thing too. I mean, you know, I kind of wandered around a lot after college. You know, I had some jobs here and then not working and then working and then not working and then you know, teaching is where I 
really felt like, okay, this, I became grounded, I had a foundation, but that idea of what are your, what's your purpose if you don't have a job that you like or, um, I don't know, I kind of grew up with this idea of you're supposed to hate work, you know, work, work sucks. But your father <laughs> loved work. Yeah, That's I would. read that. He loved to work and he loved to work after work. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I didn't, that was one of the, that's one of the things I continue to admire about him is that he has this very strong work ethic that I don't know if uh, my brother and I have inherited directly. <laughs> I, I think it kind of, um, my brother and I are uh, much more uh, thinking about what we should be doing or how, how can we do this or what's, what's the, a career or job we're really going to love and be satisfied Whereas my father kind of had um, maybe not the luxury to do that. And I think for a while I thought that was a bad thing. And I, I think more and more throughout writing this book and talking to him, I've realized that there's, uh, an op there's something freeing in that to just kind of know that this is what you have to do. This is your job. This is work. And, the structure of that and the routine. I think I've grown to appreciate structure and routine that I don't think I always, I kind of rebelled against for a while. Do you have a favorite passage in this book that you're particularly proud of, that you could read? Um, or we have students yeah. in the audience. Sure, let me see. Impromptu here, but. No, it's okay. The book is about 257 pages. Uh, softbound version is coming out this summer, I believe. Am I correct? Oh, no, it's out. It's out now. Yep. Okay. We have the hardcover version, and our associates will be selling copies of it, and you can get it autographed by Anthony when we conclude. Let's see. Sometimes some of our writers will read a passage. It's okay if... No, no, I want to. I just want to find... Um, okay. <clears throat> My father speaks his own language. A hillbilly twang of the Looney Tunes dialect, foghorn leghorn, Yosemite Sam, mixed with the African-American jive of the dirtiest comedians, Red Fox or Richard Pryor. His swearing is part of a well-oiled machine, except when a driver cuts him off, then higher octane terms explode from his mouth. He cuts words in half, stresses whichever syllable he wants. Verbs become nouns and vice versa. He throws in song lyrics, movie quotes, even slogans from TV commercials. It all swirls together, and all you can do is try to keep up. I tried. Sometimes we could speak at his pace. Other times, he'd lose me on a Sanford and Son reference, and our dialogue became a one-man show. I don't know where he got that pig language from, my grandmother says. None of the other boys talk like that. He gave all of my mother's sisters and my female cousins flirty construction worker on a coffee break nicknames. Baby sugar, sweets, mama, girl, honey. He calls my wife, Vanessa Van Halen, and when he met my brother's girlfriend, Lola, he spelled out her name, just like the kinks. In a letter to my mother from Vietnam, written in his scratchy mishmash of upper and lowercase letters, he calls her his little girl and says, let's not go spoiling this by telling Maddie, Maddie being his fiance at the time. He asked her, can you dig it? You gotta be jiving me. Hold on, mama, I'm coming home soon. He's perverted, but in a way that no one in our family seems to mind. He can pinch his sister-in-law's ass or make a sly comment about the perkiness of her breasts, and it doesn't seem to offend anyone. That's the reputation he's established and the one we've all come to expect. As a kid, I would hear snippets of my father's language everywhere. Other men on the sidelines of my soccer or football games, burly attendants at the Hess station around the corner from our house, and the slick or heroic guys in mob and war movies on HBO. Though none of these characters spoke exactly like my father, they shared similar phrases. My old lady's busting my stones. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. The union's gonna screw the part-timers out of Benny's. I often wished I had a guidebook, a father-to-son pocket translator that could define these foreign terms. For Christmas one year, he made a t-shirt for my cousin Shannon, who was working as a stewardess at the time. She unfolded the tissue paper and read the front of the shirt while it was still in the box, while my father threw up his hands proclaiming his innocence. Shaking her head, she held it up for all to see. Stewardesses always stay face down in the cockpit. When I found this scene in one of our old home movies, I watched my 10-year-old self stare at my father, <laughs> then the shirt, then back to my father, wondering where his ideas came from. So dad could have two reactions. One, that pretty well nailed it. Two, how dare you? Yeah. 
So what do you say? Um, uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think there was, we, we were chatting about this earlier at dinner. There's something uh, unique about memoir, not only because you're writing about your family, you're writing about true events. Um, you know, I spent five years writing this book, so this material was in my head, on my computer, in my head while I was running, talking about it in conversation all the time, um, to then having uh, family members experience it for the first time. So I kind of had to go back to somehow try and feel, remember what it was like to write these things for the first time or reread these things when they were fresher. Um, and uh, that's nearly impossible, right? And I think there were some moments where, yeah, I mean, people were offended and put off, but I think ultimately, um, They've been very supportive and appreciative in a lot of ways that I didn't expect. Um, is, is Dad proud of you? He is. Um, I, I believe so. <laughs> OK. Tell, me, tell our audience about Don, brother. Yeah. Reading this and just going by memory, he seems like he's an angry guy. Is he an angry guy? No, I think it. He's um, tough. Yeah, he's a tough guy. Uh, he was my older brother. Uh, he still is. And, um, you know, he was definitely, you know, if there was a tougher one, it was him. Um, and I, I idolized him the same way that I idolized my father. I was a very impressionable kid. Um, and I kind of, you know, went around like, I don't know, I was kind of like the, the human version of tofu. I was just kind of absorbing whatever flavor was around me. I was just kind of like, all right, so you're doing this. Maybe I should do that. You're doing that. Maybe I should do that. My brother's an artist. Maybe I should be an artist. My father is doing this. Maybe I should do that. And I appreciated all those things, but I, I think I had no um, kind of clear sense of my identity for a long time. So my brother was tough. I think he had the same... Um, same kind of thoughts and behavior as me, but just acted out in different ways. And I think, you know, we were both, we've both struggled with what are we supposed to do with our lives? You know, what is our job? What are we meant to do? Um, but we experienced it at different times. You know, he was kind of much more outwardly rebellious, whereas I was kind of um, much more introverted for a while. Um, until he kind of moved away, and then I kind of was like, all right, now he's gone. I can kind of assume all those qualities and be destructive <laughs> and be, you know, now I'm the, the one who's rebellious in the house. Um, so I think it was also our age difference, too. I mean, we're seven years apart, so we kind of were hitting these points in our life at different times, and um, it, I think he was, uh, he was pretty upset with some parts in the book, but I think... Over the last, so the book came out in 2012. Um, over the last, you know, year or two, um, we've grown closer in ways that um, I wasn't really expecting to. Um, I think we all have. We're, we're much more open with each other. I feel, um, and it doesn't have to, you know, link back to the book. It doesn't have to be like, well, thank you for writing that. It changed everything. Yeah. You know, it's not that. It's just kind of. At least from my perspective, I've noticed kind of subtle changes where we um, are just more open. A um. couple of things I want to cover here, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. Be thinking of your question, and Kyle will come right to you. Before Vanessa, I think it was your first major love, was a young lady named Mia, correct? And when she went away to school, the relationship sort of waned. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Has Mia read the book? Has Mia mm -hmm. commented? Uh, I haven't been in touch with her. I don't know. I know. She, I, I thought she might find you. <laughs> she was aware that the book came out. Um, I, I, th I think she sent. She. Did, I think she sent me a Facebook message or something saying like, "Oh, this is good, congrats," but never. I don't know if she read it. I always wonder when people mention other folks if they have to get their permissions when they're talking about yeah. you know personal stuff. Well, I, her name's not Mia, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even better. You were in a restaurant, working in a restaurant. Yeah. And I'm reading this thing, and I had to go back and read it again. I'm like, wait a minute, this is, he's being sexually harassed while he's working in the restaurant. This woman's grabbing you, calling yeah. you names, <laughs> making suggestions. She's much older than you. What's going on? Well, she was kind of like the female version of my dad, and I kind of gravitated towards her in a lot of ways. Uh, I kind of, that, that's the thing. I kind of appreciated that behavior in a lot of ways. I kind of, um, you know, just kind of that... There was something kind of raw and honest about that that I appreciated. And I kind of. Did she put it out there like, 
you know, this kid might go for it. If no, it, she if was, it doesn't. No, she was kind of like that with innocent? everybody. Yeah, she was kind of just, you know, just very wow. you know, um, overtly flirtatious and just kind of had that, you know, she was just like, you know, this, this tough biker woman and could just kind of, you know, those things could fly and they could be, you know, they're, you know, they're harsh and vulgar, but they became terms of endearment. And, I, and my father in a lot of ways too. You know, there's times where like he, you know, uses slang that has evolved into <laughs> terms of endearment. And yeah. um, I, I, I'm fascinated by that too, the way that language okay. can change. And, and then in the end, she's the one that introduces you to Vanessa. Right, yeah. So she's the one that set us up, yeah. We're going to come to the audience. If you'd like to ask a question about any of this, uh, Anthony's life or why he wrote what he did, we'll come to you. If you would ask your question directly, Kyle will come to you right in the front row. We begin tonight. Thank you for being here for the President's Speaker Series. Go ahead. Was the trip just uh, basically just to just to connect with him more, or was it to find yourself as a person and you like your values more? Um, I think I reached a point where, you know, I was kind of I felt like I talked to my father enough. I'd done a bunch of interviews. You know, I, I'd read a lot. I I just felt like there was still something missing. You know, I wasn't sure what, um, and there was something just kind of pulling me to go, and then my wife got this opportunity to um, teach these classes there, and it just felt like, you know what, this is, this is the right time. Um, I was in between jobs, as I often was, and it just felt like a good, kind of productive, focused thing to do. Um, I, I think that was part of it, too. I was always looking for something focused and meaningful to do, and this was another piece of this larger project that I was working on that I felt like I needed to do in order to push the book in a direction that uh, I wasn't really sure where it should go. And in a lot of ways, it, it opened up a lot of different topics that I wouldn't have written about if I didn't go. I don't want to give the whole thing away, but when yeah. you end the book, the way you end it at the memorial, mm. did you struggle with that ending? I mean, did you know this is it, it's done? Or did you have second thoughts <laughs> to end it there? Um, yeah, I, I kind of, when I talk about memoir, it's kind of like, trying to pause a movie that never stops, you know, because you could, um, you could you always- You could have gone on. You could, you could continue. You know, there's always another, there's always something else that you could possibly, if you worked enough shape in a way that could be, you know, the end or part of the book. Um, I thought when the moving Vietnam wall came to our hometown, it felt like, um, again, another one of those moments where, you know what, this is, someone or something is telling you that this needs to be in there and focused on. So. Readers will love the ending. <laughs> Up there. Good evening. What, what lessons, if any, did you learn from your father? What lessons? Yes. Huh. I, I think going back to work, um, you know, I was raised in a very, you know, blue collar family. My father, uh, worked in a deli, my mom did a lot of jobs, she cleaned houses for a while. Um, and physical work became very important to me. And I was just raised to understand work as you do this job, you come home, you wash it off, you eat dinner, you go to sleep. Um, and then I end up writing and I find myself <laughs> always trying to uh, balance it with some kind of physical activity. So, and then there's, you know, you, if you read a lot about writers, there's often um, some kind of physical component. You know, a lot of writers are runners. I'm a runner. A lot of, you know, writers do some kind of uh, feel the need to exert themselves physically after maybe exerting themselves mentally. You know, that sounds <laughs> a little too corny, but um, I think I learned from my father that um, even if work well, I guess I took that idea of physical work and then I kind of turned it into um, whether your work is physical or not, you need to feel like you've exerted yourself uh, in order to feel, uh, for me, feel whole. Back up in the audience, your question. Good evening. 
Um, all right, good evening. Uh, I'm going to get a little philosophical here. Um, sure. Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, You're going to have to hold the mic just a little closer. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, you examined your life, obviously. What, what did you discover with that? Hmm. <laughs> Can I throw a quote back at you? <laughs> um, I like James Baldwin's quote um, that it's the writer's responsibility to excavate the experiences of the people that produced him. Um, and I like that word excavate because I think memoir has a lot of digging to it, digging down, looking for some kind of true capital T <laughs> foundation. Um, so... I do feel like, I do feel like, you know, we kind of live very fast paced and uh, opportunities for uh, slowing things down are kind of rare. Um, I think even that word slow in our culture is kind of seen to have negative connotations. You know, we want everything to be fast. Um, one of the things about writing is I feel like you can kind of slow things down, slow life down a little bit, especially if you're writing about your own life. Um, and I, I, going back to that word excavate, I, I like that kind of archaeological um, connotation of it where you get to take moments from your life, kind of dig them up and hold them up to the light um, and examine them. Um, and I think we kind of all do that in one way or another, even if we're not writing about it. You know, we, I feel like we're often looking for moments to slow things down, to reflect. Um, you know, some people do it in prayer, some people do it by writing, some people do it in meditation. Um, and that became, that is something that's very important to me, even beyond this book. You taught for five years in a prison. Yeah. How did, you, how did that happen? Um, I was volunteering teaching creative writing through uh, this organization called Penn New England. Um, and it was just every other Saturday I was volunteering. And then um, I became really interested in it. And there was a position open at a prison in Boston teaching literacy. Um, so I taught for about five years teaching um, men from 18 all the way up to 70 uh, who all read before, below a fourth grade level. Um, so we would, you know, we, we would do kind of basic grammar and syllables and some guys were beginning with the alphabet. Um, but then I'd also read stories out loud and we'd get into kind of these, you know, I was always, I was always kind of pushing it in the direction of kind of, you know, working in some kind of, you know, uh, talking about gender roles and gender communication. And, uh, you know, we'd often talk about violence. We'd talk about these things that, um, a lot of the guys in the room had different experiences with than I did. Because um, I, you know, I, I began very naively. I was kind of like, oh, so we should learn how to fill out job applications, or you want to know about quarry reform. And they were like, we learn about that every day. We hear that all the time. Like, uh, they were more interested in stories, in narrative. Um, so we were able to you know, do a lot of basic literacy type things, but I would, uh, I would often read aloud to them, which um, they, hadn't, you know, they hadn't been in a school setting for a while. They would also push me to give them spelling tests and vocabulary tests just because uh, a lot of them, that was the last time they were in school was maybe in elementary school. Wow. And they, they wanted that. They, they wanted that structure. They was, wanted to be Was that in Massachusetts? Yeah, it was in Boston. Okay. And then you make the ascension to Regis College? Yep. So I'm at Regis College now. Um, I direct the writing program there. Um, so I teach some creative writing courses and... Uh, run the first year writing program. In the audience now, Kyle has a question. Good evening. Um, I have a question. This is more so uh, about your dad. I don't know. I hadn't read your book yet. Um, but as far as I'm a vet myself, um, brothers that have come back from war and things like that, after you, they would hold it back a lot. But after you brought all this back up after so many years, mm. how did that affect your dad? Um, or did it? Well, that was the thing that, um, yeah, I'll, I, I kind of get that question a lot. You know, people will ask me, was it, was it hard for your father to talk about? Um, and in a lot of ways, I was expecting it to be. I was expecting it to be difficult for him to talk about. Um, but he was very candid and open and 
willing to have you know sit there while I kind of interviewed him, um, which made me kind of feel like I could have learned these things much earlier if all I did was ask. Um, so I, he didn't find it uh, painful or difficult. Um, he was pretty much open from the beginning. Um, and in a lot of ways, it made me feel like maybe consider the other side. You know, if I think of my father as someone who's maybe not as verbal as I am or as open or talkative, um, it kind of made me think of the other side. Well, maybe no one asked him, you know? Maybe there's some responsibility on the, uh, the asker's part, you know? Um, but um, no, it's actually, in a lot of ways, you know, talking about the way that maybe the book has changed things, um, I don't know if maybe my father always wanted to be kind of more active with like our local VA and you know have uh, more of a presence there, but he, he does now, and he didn't before. And maybe that's not because of the book, but maybe it's because of conversations, or it's just not having it be something that he didn't talk about, or was just kind of in the past, that it can, um, it's still a part of him, and can still be um, something that um, that's a, still a part of his life. So. In the language of men, we'll learn that dad had two heart attacks, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you weren't, you weren't close. You had to like get to dad to get home. Mom called, said, but she referred to him as the man, correct? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, explain yeah. that, the whole thing, because that's a family thing where it becomes a little less personal. The mm -hmm. man's been in the hospital. Yeah, I kind of, I, I remember when my grandfather got sick, my grandmother, you know, um, you're not gonna come see him, the man just had a heart attack. The man is sick, you know, um, the man's lying in his hospital bed. Um, and my, when my grandmother, she, she was the one who called me to say that my father, um, that's when he had a stroke, he was in the hospital. Um, and she was saying, you know, you're not gonna come down right away, the man just had a stroke. And there was this, you know, idea of... Um, it's like him almost impersonal. Well, yeah, it kinda, you kinda go back to your base identity when your mortality is thrown in your face, I think, and it kind of, you know, kind of strips away any other identity to just, the man is sick, you know, you need to go. That was a big part of it, too. My father's language was such a fascinating thing for me for so long, and then he has a stroke where his speech is impaired temporarily, but for, you know, for me to hear um, the way that his voice changed uh, in those moments was, um, you know, kind of just brought his mortality to the surface. We learned that, what, both parents smoked. Yeah. <laughs> and then after the heart attack, they both say they're going to quit, but dad doesn't quit. No. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we were all, I was a family of smokers, um, and then, you know, we kind of each individually hit it better than others. <laughs> Back in the audience. Okay, you said your wife, Vanessa, is a feminist. When she met your dad, was she like, oh, that explains a lot of your behavior? And how did it change <laughs> yeah, afterwards? Good question. Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, it's funny because uh, my wife, Vanessa, was the one who could really get my dad to talk. They have a lot of long conversations when they're together. Um, and I don't know. I don't think she thought that. Um, I think it was more, I mean, it was more about me than about what she thought kind of trickled down from my father to me. Um, but yeah, they have, they're the ones that can communicate really well together. Um, uh. Do you feel you growing up were more like your mom than your dad in personality? Um, I think I had, I think I had both. I was kind of split. Um, you know, there were these uh, moments where I could be, you know, very vocal, but then I could be very introverted. That's um, what I noticed. So reticent at some time. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, I kind of went back and forth. In the audience, your question now for Anthony. Hello. So, kind of off, going off of your question, would you say that you're your father's son, and you emulate him in many aspects, or would you say that you've uh, metamorphosized into something of your own, your own self? I think I began with the first part that you said. You know, I kind of began as kind of a, 
Um, I was modeling myself for a replica in some way. And then um, I think I came to a point where um, just having more confidence in you know, who I want to be, what I want to be, what I think the what I thought the limits were, what I think the limits are, you know, just kind of um, pushing my own expectations. Um, I think I've, it's taken a while, you know, I think I, I struggled with that for a while, just kind of um, feeling solid in my own identity. Um, yeah. Let me see, throughout the others, right up front, go ahead. Do you feel as if your life, language, and attitude would be different if you grew up in a more female-dominated household like your wife? Hmm. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, and as I was saying before, I think what I was trying to do for a while was kind of um, shoehorn my family into my <laughs> wife's kind of feminist family, or kind of, you know, instantly <laughs> combine them and try to... Um, you know, replicate some of the conversations that my wife was having with her family that um, my family were having, but in a different way. Um, and I think it was, they were much more, my wife's family is much more vocal. My family was much more just kind of activity based, you know, doing something physical. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think it would have been much different. Do you look at this book now as perhaps, because you're going to become a father soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is an early life legacy for you to leave to your child? I was actually, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, probably in the last, what, seven and a half months. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, we're all kind of fascinated about what our parents' lives were like before we were around. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all had those moments where we kind of are cleaning out you know, old pictures or something, and we get distracted, and we end up flipping through photo albums or looking at old letters or um, something like that. And I, I like the idea of kind of having this portrait of myself at this time, um, and it kind of exists for however long people are going to appreciate words. Up front, Arthur. Good evening. Did you, you, you talked about your father and the prostitutes in Vietnam, but did he have any of the horrible war experiences that, that would keep him up or you know, would, would just... Such as like, Agent like, Orange? Or traumatic stress or mm. uh, um, things like that that he would talk about? No, uh, not in kind of like, you know, the ways that at least, you know, Hollywood tells us. Um, not in, you know, he didn't... And I think that's a lot of those stories I expected. I think that's why some of his stories surprised me. But the kind of, the ways that Vietnam vets have been affected have sort of come out later with my father. Like he, so he, not too long ago, he got a tattoo that, um, with the dates of when he was in Vietnam. Um, just, you know, it was kind of random. Him and my brother went and got it. And then You he, and Don have one too, right? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So he, um, he gets the, this tattoo with the dates on it. Uh, he goes to... Uh, uh, for a checkup at the VA, uh, the nurse sees it and says, oh, um, you were there during this time, you should um, check out this uh, Agent Orange study that was going on here about how Agent Orange is being, uh, exposure is being linked to heart disease. Um, and, and then he ends up particip participating in that study and there's a chance that some of the exposure to Agent Orange affected um, some of the heart issues that he's had. Um, so, you know, while he may not have there weren't some of those, you know, maybe those classic stories that I was, like I said, naively expecting. Um, they're, they, they've been coming out in other ways. Looking for anyone with a question now. If you raise your hand, Kyle will come right to you. Are you going to write a second book about your life, or what's your next book going to be? Um, I've actually been working more about... Uh, about um, my experiences teaching in the prison. Um, I, uh, one of my students was uh, imprisoned in the facility that he helped build. So he was a former construction worker um, imprisoned in the facility that he helped build. And I remember him in class, um, you know, every once in a while I'd see him just kind of looking around, admiring it, or he'd tell me about how it was so well constructed. And he was proud of the building. Um, 
and he also helped construct some of the major uh, kind of iconic buildings in Boston and some of the schools and colleges. Um, so I kind of just became interested in this idea of uh, prisoners building their own prisons. And there's actually a pretty rich and disturbing history of that that um, I've been just kind of getting more into lately. So I'm more in like the research phase now. Yeah, be sure to let us know. What, what impression, that five years, what was it about prisons that you didn't know or you walked away from that experience knowing that you didn't know when you went into it? Um, that most of my students just really wanted to talk. We spent a lot of time talking. Um, and sometimes it was on topic, sometimes it wasn't. But um, there, in every other place in the prison, they were told to shut up and not have an opinion. And then I come in and I'm saying, well, what do you think of this story? Or what's your opinion on this? And for a while it was silent. Um, when we started to connect it to some of the experiences that they've had, um, connecting it to their own lives, it, the class became much more vocal. Um, and they want to be heard. These yeah, people yeah. want to be heard. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, some of the things people ask me is like, did you ever feel threatened, or was there officers in the room with you, or did anyone ever get violent with you? And it was those things never really happened. There was, you know, never a time where anyone was violent towards me, or I felt like, or I felt unsafe. Um, you know, no one, no one would ever really ask me about, oh, what were you teaching these guys? Or, you know, what were you talking about in class? It was more, you know, what are they making out of bars of soap, you know? And, what, you know, just kind of you know, how much are they working out? You know, these kind of like just these things we see over and over again in movies um, that my students weren't doing. Back in the audience, your question for Anthony. When you finally uh, took a step back and examined your life and everything that happened to you, what did you discover? Uh, <laughs> Um, what did I discover? I, th I think uh, one of the things that I discovered was that I, I kind of, um, I just kind of accepted a lot of things. I didn't really question or um, try and decide on my own about what I wanted to do or the decisions that I was making. It was kind of just, um, doing what I felt was expected of me. Um, and I think kind of developing the confidence to just do what I want to do um, has been a big part of this book and kind of a big part of who I am now. Um, but I don't think I have any answers. You know, I think that's oftentimes, um, kind of going back to what you were saying about therapy, right? Um, you know, I, I don't, come to the end of this book and feel like I have answers about myself or my family. Um, I think for a while, naively, I thought that's what I was doing. I was coming up. I was solving something. Um, but I don't think memoir is about answers. It's more about questioning, about um, exploring these questions, about asking better questions. Anthony, it's the language of men. No sisters. No sisters, no. Was that, do you wish that you'd had sisters? Was that missing? Did you feel that that was missing when you were growing up with Don? Um, no, I, I mean, I think it would have changed the dynamic in some way, obviously. But um, no, I, I didn't feel like there was a you know, missing piece or anything. Will readers know about cousins, aunts, uncles? Are there other people outside of the immediate family? That are in the book? That, are it, that shaped your life? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, sure, in, in lots of ways. Um, but. I feel like I, I really focused on, you know, my, my father is pretty much, besides me, the main character in the book, and it was kind of my, um, you know, um, I, I do see it as a tribute to him in a lot of ways, um, but I, I also see it as kind of, um, okay, now, now where am I, you know, um, stepping out of that shadow. For our radio audience, as well as those here, and I hope you'll get a copy of this book, there's a scene in this book about cars. And there's one particular time there's a car, and help me understand this. The radiator cap blew mm -hmm. and went, what happened? Was, mm -hmm. that a, was that a car that dad worked on that uh, something happened? No, that was uh, my car. So we, we rebuilt a 66 Dodge Coronet together, um, and that was my first car. and. Um, 
it was, you know, we, we got it as good as we could get it. And, uh, you know, we were saving money. We were doing it ourselves. You know, it was, it was great. Um, but there were moments where, you know, things busted loose and things, uh, you know, the, the, the radiator cap exploded and there was this antifreeze spraying everywhere. And it was, you know, after we had it, you know, it was this perfect, you know, cherry red paint and it was, you know, just kind of this green ooze splattering all over the car. And it was. Is he behind you while you're driving? Yeah, the car? yeah. So he, he pulls up next to me while I'm, you know, um, in the breakdown lane. And, uh, you know, we're both kind of frantically trying to clean it up. And uh, it was, you know, one of those moments of <laughs> it's looking good on the outside, but we got some internal things going on right now. <laughs> Do you feel that you've inherited that from your father, the mechanical prowess? Oh, not enough. Not, not enough? Clearly not <laughs> enough, no. I, I wish more. Um, you know, pr pretty handy, but not, not like him. You know, when he comes up to visit, I'm like, oh, yeah, I have a list going. You know, I was like, that light's not working. I have no idea why. Uh, that step, I don't know, it's a little creaky. Can you help me out with that? You know? <laughs> I, when I was researching you, there's a really neat photo of your father working on a car. That's dad, right? Working on the car? Yeah. That's typical. That's the way I pictured him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> In the audience, questions way back there. Good evening. Uh, when you were starting to come up with all the ideas, and most people, in the uh, when they have all these memories, why did you want to put it into a book? Hmm, good question. Um, I was just really fascinated with just memoir as a genre. Um, I think it often gets, uh, often gets put down as, you know, all right, so it happens, so it's not so creative. Um, I like the idea of, as I said before, kind of having these scenes that you can tinker with, but you can't make things up. So you need to find some kind of narrative structure. Um, so I think I was fascinated with the idea of you know turning it into a narrative. Um, I, I don't know. I wasn't really thinking much about kind of you know I'm gonna I want this to be a book to influence people or anything like that. I, I just kind of felt like you know. I was interested in like narrative structure in memoir, um, and you know I guess there's you know there's a certain amount of uh, wanting an audience for your work too. You know you want that audience component to it. That's kind of you know um, in some ways that feels like when a book is finished, right? Is when a reader is reading it. So that kind of having some response and having a dialogue about it. Um, but you mean like, why would I want to publish it? Um, I mean, I guess kind of the reasons why a writer would want to publish anything, you know, have, having an audience feedback, partly ego, partly wanting some kind of validation. Um, the people who thought something of, of this book wrote Tracy Kidder one of my favorites, uh, writes, this book is an impressive debut from a young writer. Mr. Diaries has many admirable traits, including a distinctive style. It is a pleasure to keep company with him in these moving and insightful pages. That prompted me to ask you of writing style. Is there someone that you admired, mm -hmm. someone that you really appreciated, enjoyed reading, and sort of adopted part of that within your own style of writing? Sure. Uh I'm a big fan of Tobias Wolf. I like uh, Raymond Carver's short stories. Um, I was, I think, whether it was fiction or nonfiction, I was interested in kind of um, quote unquote everyday, you know, normal suburban lives. Um, I, it was funny because you were talking about differences between me and my brother. Uh, my brother is often fascinated with you know these adventure stories of you know exploring the Amazon jungle or you know, these kind of you know climbing Mount Everest, um, and I. I enjoy those books for a moment, but I, I often kind of find myself, uh, my mind starts wandering. Um, but I like those stories of um, seemingly simple families or everyday lives um, and how they're much more complex and how you know, all of our lives are complex. Um, and that's what I, I love about memoir, and that's why I think it's different than autobiography, is that um, you know, I'm not writing 
you know, from the day I was born to the present. Um, no one would want to read that. Um, but memoir gives you the opportunity to kind of focus in on a particular aspect of your life or, you know, keep exploring um, these scenes through a particular lens. Um, and I, I'm also fascinated by the idea of writing more than one memoir, like the, the authors that revisit topics as your perspective changes, you know? I mean, that's the thing, too. It's like, uh, kind of going back to the question before about it, you know, what have you learned or, you know, and me talking about it not being about an answer is because this was my perspective at that time. And that has changed and will change and will continue to change. I remember talking to one of my uh, professors who's a memoirist and he um, was working on his book for a long time and it was turning out to be kind of separated into three chunks of when he wrote it in his mid-20s, when he was writing you know, in his 30s or 40s, and when he was writing in his 50s and 60s. Um, and at that point, the manuscript was kind of chronicling his changing perspective over the course of his life. So, um, you know, something had happened this second that would make me write a completely different book than the one I did at that time. You know, things can, things can shift, things can change. You have another book out, don't you? I or, do not, know. I thought for some reason there was another one that you've written. What I liked, too, about this was that I could relate to your dad as well. He's a few, maybe just a few years older than me, but he's like me, or I'm like him. I'm stuck in the 60s, late 60s <laughs> into the 70s. The music he liked, the radio station he would listen to, the way it would energize him when he heard the music. How would your mother react? Did, did, she share those same feelings about the music, or she just said, that's him and that's why I love him? No, she, she loves all, that, all those uh, bands and music and you know, a lot of the movies that we like too, but again, she was kind of more behind the scenes in a lot of ways. Um, you know, my, my dad and I would always kind of play this, uh, kind of name that tune game where we would uh, you know, quote, uh, test each other with lyrics. Um, do you do that and, with movies too? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. all the De Niro stuff and yeah, I mean my <laughs> good fellas and all that. Yeah, my brother and I kind of communicate. Our text messages would look like if you just put them all together, they would probably turn out to be the script from three or four different Robert De Niro movies. Um, but um, oftentimes, my mom knew knew those lyrics and could answer those questions. But um, in a lot of ways, it was a guy's game. But then I remember hearing moments where you know I'm falling asleep in the back of the car when I'm little and they're playing that game together when we're not awake. Um, and there are those moments where you get a glimpse of your parents' lives before you were around. Um, and there's, there's stories I don't know. And there's stories that, you know, um, I'll never know all the stories. And there's something, um, there's something rich and fascinating about that that, um, that idea of never really knowing all the parts of someone. You know, I said this earlier in the interview. When you read this book, you're touched by it because you know someone who either experienced or thought some of the things that are written in this book. And I sent you messages a couple of times today saying, I know this. There's a story in here about a stolen watch. <laughs> Do you mind telling that? <laughs> sure. Um, so I was uh, went through a bit of a a bit of a kind of a kleptomaniac phase, um, as a lot of young kids do. Um, and I remember uh, going to my father's friend's house, and um, I remember they had this am amazing Coke bottle collection of um, just all these old Coke bottles and all this Coca-Cola memorabilia. And you know, so you're a kid and you're wandering around and you're you're looking at all this stuff. And uh, I remember there being a watch that had the little like Coca-Cola bears on it, and um, for some reason, you know, in the moment it just makes sense. Like I'm going to take that. <laughs> you don't even know why you do these things. And um, how old are you? I, you do I, I, don't, I don't know. I was in elementary school, um, so you know, eight or nine or something like that. And uh, then feeling like the watch gathered more power the longer I had it, and. Uh, it was just a matter of time before it, you know, burned a hole in my dresser and everyone saw it. And you know, like just, it was. Uh, I had to get rid of it. So then I, um, 
Yeah, I just took it down the street and smashed it. That, that was my answer to it. Not give it back or admit it, but just destroy it. Um, and I remember my, right when I was doing it, it was one of those moments where like, you know, your parents know what you're doing and they're gonna find you, so you better hide. And I was at, a, at the end of the street doing it, and right as I was doing it, my dad was turning around the corner and pulling up the street. Um, and, and I've asked him about it, and he was like, I didn't know what you were doing, but I, <laughs> I was convinced that he knew. Um, because the, when the watch was broken, you throw it in some bushes, yeah. and then the parts disappear? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I threw it in the bushes, and then I went back to look for it the next day, and they were gone. Um, <laughs> and are they just deeper in the weeds somewhere? Or, I don't know, for me, I was, you know, I was convinced. That was more about being a kid at that moment and believing that my dad had saw me and gone back and collected the parts and was going to, you know. That's uh, one of those stories that's yeah. in this book. We have time for one more question in the audience. Back here, thank you for being with us. Um, my, my last question would be, we talk about living our life the best of our potential. And would you say that you going into your father's life, going to Vietnam, is, was that like an obstacle you wanted to overcome just to be a better man and it, it helped complete your life? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard because I guess in hindsight I can say, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think just having the confidence to pursue something when you don't know why you're doing it um, is an important skill to learn. Sometimes we're always trying to figure out exactly why we're doing what we're doing. And I think as a writer, you can um, kind of stunt yourself or kind of edit yourself prematurely if you think, no, this is what it has to be about. This is what I'm writing. I think for a while, and I think that maybe that's why it took a good chunk of time, was that I felt like, no, I'm writing about this. No, wait, now I'm writing about this. Um, and I think when I started to pull back and allow myself to kind of wander a little bit and not uh, feel like I had to know all the answers before, or, or even get away from that idea of answers, um, that gave me the confidence to kind of wander in other ways later on, you know, um, give myself time to figure things out, whether it's, you know, something challenging at work or it's, you know, you're having an argument with your wife and you're trying to, you know, you feel that impulse to solve it right away, where it's, you know, maybe we just need to kind of, you know, linger in this moment. Um, my, one of my other uh, writing mentors, his favorite three words were dwell, linger, stay. And, you know, I remember him writing that in the margins of a lot of things that I wrote, just dwell here for a while, linger here for a while, stay in that moment. Um, and not feel like I need to know why I'm doing this. Um, so just kind of giving myself, or developing the confidence to wander for longer than you think you might have the stamina for. <laughs> Anthony will be signing copies of this book coming up in the next few minutes, and uh, my colleagues Brendan and Winston will be selling copies right there, and as soon as we complete, Anthony will make his way right over to the table, so if you'd all line up over there, you can say hello for a few moments and maybe get a signed copy of the book. I want to thank a few people who made this broadcast possible in this event tonight. Tony Petro, who's joined us now in, in IT, uh, Kyle Corbett, Richard Weekly, who's been with us since the very beginning, uh, Brendan Corey, uh, Conroy, I should say, Chris Hoto, and uh, John Wara back at our station for producing tonight's event. And Dr. M.B. McClatchy, who made this suggestion so many months ago, thank you so much for your thoughtfulness and coming forward to us. Our next event is coming up a week from tomorrow night, and it's a beauty. It's one that you don't want to miss. We're going to talk about terrorism and communication. Coming up Thursday night, March 6th, Dr. Jonathan Matuzitz, Associate Professor at UCF, will talk about his book, Terrorism and Communication, A Critical Introduction. He will outline 15 different ways that terrorism exists and the reasons, and you're going to be surprised at what he says. C-SPAN will be here for that, and it will be live on 1150 WNDB. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a round of applause for Anthony Dieres. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy your evening on WNDB. More of Sean Hannity.